Hello everybody, this is John Buck back with yet another linear, continuous time linear systems video. In today's video we're going to talk about the magnitude phase representation for the frequency response. Just getting started with filtering, I've sort of set it up so far in the class so that the filters you see have real frequency response h of j omega, but more generally h of j omega can be a complex function, right? We know h of j omega is the Fourier transform of the impulse response. So <clears throat> In general, h of j omega is the Fourier transform of the impulse response, like I've shown here. So we can get complex valued functions from this e to the minus j omega t. And so starting today, we're going to look at a more uh, complete view of the world where we say, well, that h of j omega is a complex function. It means it has a real and an imaginary part. But it turns out if we want to interpret how a system is going to affect a signal at a particular frequency, it's easier not to think about the real and imaginary part, but instead to think about the polar form of h of j omega, that is to write h of j omega in terms of its magnitude and phase. So when I write it in this form with magnitude and phase, right, we have the h of j omega is the magnitude, which is always a real uh, function uh, and generally must be positive, right? So this is a, a real function, and it's greater than or equal to zero. And then we have e to the j, and this is the phase of h up here. Right, and right, we can write down the equations for how we get those. The magnitude is just based on the squares of the real and imaginary parts. So if I write h in terms of its real and imaginary part, like I've shown here, then the, uh, mag the magnitude is the square root of the square of the real and imaginary. And the phase is the arctangent of the ratio of the imaginary to the real. Okay, and then both of these definitions sort of make sense. If you remember thinking about the, this in, in polar form, right, we can think about it in, in uh, real and imaginary or polar in, in terms of a complex plane. When I do this, right, here's my real and imaginary parts. Oop, should have labeled my axes. So here's my real axis, my imaginary axis. Right, the length of this vector here is the magnitude of h. And this angle in here is the phase of h. And then what we're saying by saying is h of j omega is that as we vary omega, this point in the complex plane is moving around at different frequencies. So the magnitude may get longer or shorter, and the phase will also change as well. Well, let's think about how, why the magnitude and phase is better. It's because what happens in this system when I go to the frequency domain. Right? If I go back up here to my system, I say, well, on the frequency side of that, I have an x of j omega going in, a y of j omega going out, and the output is the product of x of j omega and h of j omega. Right? And the big advantage, the big win for polar forms of complex numbers is when it's time to multiply things, right? Adding and subtracting works well with real and imaginary parts. Multiplying and dividing complex numbers works better in polar form. So let's go to a new page and see how that works out. So I've got, again, my output Fourier transform is the input Fourier transform times the frequency response. And now let me write all three of these out in polar form. So for each of these functions, I have the magnitude of y times e to the j phase of the output. Is, is again, I've written x and h in polar forms. And let me now just, because the multiplication is commutative, I can rearrange these terms. So I've got them all together like this. And then I can look at those, uh, those two exponentials at the end and say, well, I multiply two things with the two exponent, exponentials with the same base, I can add the exponents. So by moving things around, I've made it quite clear now that, that this first piece here is the magnitude. Right, that the magnitude of y, the magnitude of the output, will be the product of the individual magnitudes, whereas the phase will be the sum of the phases. And that's the way multiplying complex numbers work. When I multiply two complex numbers, I multiply their magnitudes, and I add their phases. So let me just sort of pull that out into separate equations for the magnitude and phase. So from this point of view, remember the, this, this makes it a little easier to interpret what the filter is doing, because remember the magnitude of x of j omega tells me how much in terms of the recipe, the Fourier transform being a recipe, magnitude of x of j omega tells me how much of each uh, frequency is in this, the input signal. h of j omega is telling me how much to scale 
the energy at that frequency or the the, the the components of that frequency to get the output. So sort of how does the output recipe, how does the input recipe get scaled to form the output recipe? Whereas phase is about timing, right? We've said the phase, like a phase of a sine or a cosine is about how much it shifts left and right while it keeps the same shape. And so by adding phase, oh, I've got a, a mistake here. I just realized this should be uh, phase of h plus phase of x. Let me fix that. So sort of the, the phase of, the, of each ingredient gets shifted some amount that depends on the phase of h or j omega. Now, like I said earlier, the systems we've mostly done so far in class, I've made gone out of my way to make sure all of them had a real h of j omega. So the phase was zero. So you didn't have to worry about the phase, just the, the scaling. But now we're going to start to get, with, as we deal with more practical real filters, we need to think about this effect. One way I find it helpful to think about this sometimes is to actually think of this as a cascade uh, H of J omega is a cascade of two systems. The first one is, does the magnitude, and the second does the phase. So the advantage of this is, is that I can think about each thing one at a time here as I go through the system. If I'm thinking about the Fourier transform in frequency, right? the first thing I do is I say I go through the system with a magnitude of H of J omega. Well, because the magnitudes are always real, that means this piece has zero phase. right? So this is Affecting the gain, you can think of like the vertical. This is affecting the vertical dimension of the Fourier transform by either amplifying it or attenuating it. All right, so this is a real function with zero phase. And again, just what I said a second ago, I've, I've written down here. And then if I think about what goes on in the second system, well, the phase, again, is about timing. But if we think about the magnitude of this box, well, there's, there's sort of implicitly, writing it in this polar form, there's a magnitude of one that's implicitly here. So there's no, there's no gain in the second box. All the gain or attenuations happen in the first box. The second box is just about timing shifts, how much each frequency is shifted in time. So again, the second box has nothing to do with the vertical dimension. It's not amplifying or attenuating anything. It's only telling me how much each frequency gets shifted left or right based on the, on the timing, right? How much phase gets added to each one. So the first box is sort of all about the vertical dimension of the signal, which things are getting amplified or attenuated. The second box is about how much things shift left and right. Okay, so I think that's enough for this now. I'm going to move on, start a separate video for talking about the specifications uh, for practical filter frequency responses. Uh, so I'll pick up with a new video there. Talk to you next time.